is that working for everybody fine okay thank you um i want to look at some of the myths of the first world war um when i talk about myths I'm not talking in the biblical sense, um, a biblical study sense of you know, stories of great truth, which may not be factually correct, but in part great truths. Like we might talk about the Garden of Eden myth. I'm talking about myths in the um, common everyday sense of something that is simply not true. And one of the main causes of the myths about the First World War, of course, um, is Blackadder. Um, you will have remembered the Blackadder final scene uh, when they go over the top. But the whole of that series um, is full of all the myths of the First World War. Totally um, pathetic generals who didn't know what they were doing, junior officers who had got no contact with reality, um, the whole sense of futility. Um, and that continues not just in Blackadder, but in lots of um, uh, programmes to this day. Um, the mythology of First World War, three of them, men enlisting in response um, to government propaganda. You, you must join up. Um, and that's really not the case. Um, ineffectual and cowardly officers, uh, this overwhelming sense of utility. Um, you'll remember that sign, you'll have seen that um, poster on the right. Um, it's often used uh, more contemporarily for uh, similar spoof ideas. In fact, the print run of that poster was very, very limited indeed. And we don't think that that many people saw it at all. It was not significant. It only became iconic afterwards. Um, they were aware of the dangers they faced. Um, the idea that people were told it will all be over by Christmas. Um, no public person ever said that. Perhaps the men wrote home to their sweethearts, don't worry, darling, it will be over by Christmas. Um, but the evidence is that that was never said in Lord Grey said this is going to be a long, long battle. Yes, the, the daily papers, the national papers were censored um, to quite a significant extent. Uh, but if you turn to the local press by October of 1914, there are lists there of name after name after name after name um, of those who have died from the local area. People knew the toll very, very, very early on. And most of the pressure to sign up to enlist um, seems to have come from peer pressure, not defending peer pressure, um, but it wasn't just the government saying you must. It was that sense of a common aim, uh, of, a, of a common purpose. What about the ineffectual and cowardly officers? And um, the facts are that the death rates among the junior officers were significantly greater than among the men they led. Yes, you can play with the statistics again and say yes, but yes, but. Um, but most of those junior officers grew up in the public schools where their job was to lead Britain and her empire. Uh, and they saw that as the, their almost God-given role. And that's why they went over the top with their men. Um, and that's why they had such a huge loss of life. The problem of the loss of life was not due entirely to the generals. Yes, the generals were learning their way. Yes, some of them were not very effective. But the problem was it was the first industrialised war with trench warfare. And um, basically, uh, there was the trenches that were fixed for so long, for so many months, um, so many seasons, um, because of the defensive weaponry led to a stalemate, and only the development of the tank broke that. Uh, and you can't blame the generals for not having a way um, of, of winning a war more efficiently or with a, a greater loss of life. And then that overwhelming sense of futility that comes through Blackadder and all the so many other narratives, um, like, oh, what a lovely war, written, of course, in the 60s. Um, but the most important thing to say is that there's not much evidence of that sense of futility during the war. As we shall see, um, as the 20s go on, attitudes change. Um, but too easily, we look at things that were written in the late 20s and think um, they actually reflect general opinion during the war. Let me give you um, an example of that. Um, this is part of a diary written by Geoffrey Husbands. Um, grew up between Nottingham and Derby, went to the uh, Moravian school between those two cities and he happened to be in England uh, in November 18 uh, and he recorded this in his diary. He was a very well-spoken gentleman and um, it's called Geoffrey's War because um, 
all his friends took the, the mick out of the way he pronounced his own name, Geoffrey. And all week, Armistice, that blessed and that mystic and blessed word had been in the air with incessant rumours that the war was almost over. And at Bethesda Chapel that night, the coming of peace seemed very near. We sang with deeper feeling and more than the usual heartiness that a favourite hymn evokes to any time. Now thank we all our God. And as the service ended, we poured out into the darkness of the streets. It did indeed seem we were right at the end of an evening. No sense of futility there, sense of thank God um, we've done it. And of course, you may know that most of the mythology about World War I is negative. That of World War II is almost universally positive. Um, think of um, Darkest Hour, um, think of Dunkirk in the last few years, all really positive, gung ho stuff. Um, as compared with World War I, 1917 has just come out on DVD. If you haven't seen it, it's worth going to see. I saw it in the cinema. But after, soon after it was released, people were complaining how unrealistic it was um, because they had the men running over clean, green fields in eastern France. And the war wasn't like that, they said. It was trenches. It was mud. Where was the mud? This wasn't genuine. Uh, but, of course, it was because people were, uh, when there were advances of the lines or when there were retreats to the lines, yes, they were going over virgin grass. But so... Um, firm on our people about this mud and futility trope that, that green fields sent people into apoplexy. It, it wasn't like that. So let's look at some of the um, three religious myths I want to look at quickly this morning. Um, the first myth, perhaps in one sense the least significant, um, is that the chaplains were all ineffective and cowardly um, except for the Roman Catholics. Then there's the mythology around conscientious objection. Um, not that it didn't exist, but it's not a myth in that sense. Um, but the way in which, particularly in the last few years, uh, oh, so much of the church's focus has been on that, and we really have not done justice to the history of religion um, in the First World War. Uh, and the third myth is that the faith, the war destroyed the faith of millions of people. And I will try and show that they are all three myths. Uh, the Chaplin myths um, probably owe its origin to goodbye to all that by robert graves um, he laid into everybody when he wrote his book in 1929 for the regimental chaplains as a body we had no respect if the regimental chaplains had shown one tenth the courage and endurance of other human qualities that the regimental doctors showed we agreed the british expeditionary force might well have started a religious arrival revival but they had not notice when it was written 1929 when all that disillusionment had set in. Why did he do it? Um, when he wrote his second edition 30 years later, or 28 years later, um, he explains here, I won't read it word for word, um, why he did it. And he admitted to the Daily Mail in a letter that he'd taken all the negative stuff from all sorts of different books and, and moulded them together um, to try and produce a book that would sell because he wanted to finance his life. Um, he wrote in 1959, reading goodbye to all that over again for the first time since 29. I wonder how my publishers escape a libel action. He wrote. But that coloured people's views until relatively recently. It's only in the last 15, 20 years that scholars have gone back to look at the chaplains of every denomination uh, and say that's a load of rubbish. So what was the reality? The reality was that more than 170 chaplains died in active service or for injuries they received during the First World War. Um, in 1917, a book was published called The Church in the Furnace, which were the reflections of Anglican chaplains on their experience in the trenches, looking at different issues. And, and even by September 1917, uh, that was a list of some of their colleagues who had been killed in action or died of wounds uh, or died on active service. Over 200 chaplains were awarded the Military Cross for bravery. And um, perhaps the most famous is um, Stuart Kennedy, Woodbine Willie, awarded the Military Cross for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty during the attack on Messine Ridge, searching out the wounded while under heavy fire and helping them to a dressing station. Uh, he most famously said, the more par I said, the more Padres died in battle doing Christian deeds, the better. Um, but perhaps a better example is, is Theodore Hardy, uh, nowhere near as famous as uh, 
Oscar that Kennedy or Tubby Clayton. Um, he was too old to be a chaplain, so he badgered away and badgered away and badgered away. He was accepted at the age of 51 to be a chaplain at 51 um, to undergo the rigours of France. He was awarded the Victoria Cross of the SO, the Military Cross. He was the most decorated non-combatant in World War I. Uh, he died, he was killed three years, three day, weeks before the armistice. And then the mythology um, about conscientious objection. Um, as I say, not, a, not that it didn't exist, not that there weren't some very loyal men, but it totally distorts our understanding of Christian involvement in the First World War if we focus so much as I fear we have done. It's a rhetorical question. What percentage of articles on World War I and religion published um, during the centenary years focused on conscientious objection? A huge number, I don't know the figures, but I do believe they are disproportionate if we are trying to understand why our Methodist ancestors 100 years ago um, engaged in the First World War as they just did. And I think there are perhaps three reasons for this focus on conscientious objection. I have to say, not least by the Museum of Primitive Methodism. Um, yes, the, the COs were heroic and brave. Of course they were. And um, they set, they changed the, our country's attitudes towards conscientious objection so that the Second World War, uh, objectors were treated much better and much more honourably and, and appropriately. But I think one of the issues is that their attitudes chime with uh, commonly held uh, contemporary Christian attitudes to military conflict. We think most of us can remember attitudes in the Falklands and, and that argument with Nicholas Thatcher. Um, or Iraq, uh, when the church has been um, very critical of our engagement there. Uh, and so what happened with the conscientious objectors chimes with our contemporary views. Uh, and that's much more comfortable uh, than trying to engage with those whose views we find difficult to comprehend. And let's face it, many in the church are scandalised by the fervour with which their predecessors fervently supported Britain's declaration of war and engagement in, in World War I. But the COs had no monopoly of heroism, heroism and bravery. I want to introduce you briefly to a chap called Ernest Goodridge. He grew up uh, in a Wesleyan family um, in Doncaster or near Doncaster. His brother uh, was a probationer minister uh, down in Devon during the war, and he's written uh, a diary which has also been published uh, as, um, as Ernest has. Uh, it's fascinating insights from a deeply committed Christian man who felt it was his God-given duty to engage um, as a soldier in the First World War. On the 5th of November, uh, 15, writes to a friend, the greater cause had come to end this. We are men of freedom and liberty for which our fathers have shed their lives blood. And you commented that the effect on his parents is only the sacrifice which thousands of homes have made. A year or so later, he writes home, he writes a lot to his parents and to a family friend in the church. If the businesses as we anticipate, there are sure to be some of us go west. And not being assured as dear Paul as to what may be God's will concern me, I thought I would take this opportunity to open up my heart. I shall always thank God both in time and in eternity for the dear friends who I have met during training, particularly, and then he lists a whole list of them. If it be possible, think of me as a guardian spirit watching over you all and beckoning to higher heights of Christian experience until that happy day when we shall all be able to sing safe home, safe home in port, yours until the dawn shall break and the shadows flee away with eternal love. Ernest. I've read this scores of times and I still find it emotional because of that strength of his faith. Ernest Goodrich died on the following day. And then this whole attitude uh, chiming with contemporary views. But it's anachronistic to think uh, that the majority 100 years ago would think as we think today. And if we look back without trying to understand the fervent support of the churches, all the churches, two thirds of Quaker men sign up in one way or another um, in, in the war. 
Um, we can be scandalized unless we try to understand. In the church times, the editorial, we are engaged not in a scheme of aggrandizement at the expense of other nations, but in a supreme effort to check the designs of a power that would bring us into subjection. It seems that many, even Christians, must do this. We have been the first, upon those who have been the first to take the sword, rest the blame for putting us and our allies to the dire necessity of resorting to arms. Or even, if I may quote the president of the Primitive Methodist Conference, the noble, talking about the noble cause this nation has espoused. The call of our beloved nation to all of us to render service in any and every conceivable way will meet with a ready and immediate response on the part of us all. That is pretty unambiguous stuff. Um, and that reflects the vast majority view in the primitive Methodist Church, more so in the leadership, but across the nation. Um, that was by and large the case. And thirdly, the myth that the war destroyed the faith of millions of people. When I started looking at the First World War, uh, as Tim said, something like 15, 18 years ago now, I started with the assumption that surely, given the scale of World War One, it must have done, it must have done. Uh, a million Allied losses, huge devastation, and all those um, tropes of the trenches in the First World War and what the men thought, surely it must have done. But the reality is, it didn't. Yes, some lost their faith. Uh, Private Bartram, after the first day of the Battle of the Somme, from that moment all my religion died, all my teaching and beliefs in God have left me never to return. And there were many people like that. I'm not denying that in the slightest. Or Ernest Raymond, who served as a World War I chaplain, wrote in 68 of a grand dual post-war loss of faith. While not firmly doubting the dogmas and miracles, I could no longer say in the words of Newman's hymn, firmly, I believe, and truly. Or a rather more um, subtle uh, response from a court of Ronald Skirth. At 19, I found my standards of conduct obsolete, my ideals shattered. I had lost all faith in institutional religion. My church had authorized me to break the Sixth Commandment in the name of patriotism. Blessed are the peacemakers, not in 1917. Blessed are the war winners. I still believed in God, though I was assailed by doubts. I prayed daily. If he loved us, if he were in om omnipotent, he could put a stop to it today. But then I thought, perhaps he isn't omnipotent. Eventually I worked it out, at least for myself. God was all right. The reason for all this was the wickedness of ourselves and not the indifference of God. There is a huge paucity of evidence about people's faith and their faith responses. Um, we all know about the silence of the survivors. It happens in every conflict. Men have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan and found it impossible to share their experiences with their family because it is so such a horrible experience and, and so outside the experience of civilians. And there were millions of men who came back from both world wars who never said a thing. And therefore, we kind of fill the gap about faith. And that goes with the traditional reticence, um, particularly among the British, um, to talk about matters of faith. You don't talk about religion, you don't talk about politics. And, and the latter seems to be going these days, uh, for better or worse. And then the diffusive Christianity. It's a phrase um, the First World War Bishop um, coined, or just before the First World War. Um, religion was something that people did. The First World War, 40% of people still went to church. It was practice. It was a way of life. Um, it was diffusive amongst them. Um, but it wasn't the kind of faith that caused you to want to share it and, or talk about it very much. For that. So if we can't measure faith, can we measure church going and um, church membership? Not an exact correlation with faith. Uh, but generally, a reasonably decent indicator of religious faith. Uh, and Clive Field has done a lot of work in this area. Um, across, across Protestant denominations, 
there was a general decline in church going, uh, but it was just continuing uh, pre-war trends. It didn't particularly accelerate at all. Um, CV and non-conformist membership declined during the war, but, but um, revived briefly in the 1920s, which again undermines this idea that the First World War um, caused a huge widespread loss of faith. Um, non-conformist denominations lost around one million Sunday school scholars, uh, and one other member of this seminar would gladly answer any questions about that, Katrina, thank you. And the strange thing is, strange in the sense of topicality, uh, the impact of the flu pandemic was far greater um, on the church than that of the conflict, not least because, of course, even in those days, 60 odd percent of churchgoers were women, um, and whereas most of the losses in the First World War were men, um, this um, impacted much more on the church. Um, for that reason, um, Kerry Gilbert and Horsley uh, have done a lot of plotting in this area. Um, there was a decline of membership of non-conformists and, and how you define membership of the Anglican Church during the conflict. But by 25, it got back to um, pre-war levels. That's in absolute terms, not in relative terms. Um, the population, of course, is increasing. So in relative terms, it wasn't a return to pre-war levels. Uh, and Adrian Gregory has pointed out the portion of newborn infants baptised reached a peak in the 1920s, again after the First World War, and before it began its decline that so accelerated in the, in the past couple of decades. And so I think I share Clive Field's conclusions. Um, the war wasn't a setback for faith uh, as much as a setback for organised um, irreligion. He means by that all the activities around the periphery of the church, um, which were really undermined, um, all the groups, uh, as many of you will know at that time, um, the church is trying to provide a total social package of activities uh, for its members to stop them going into things they shouldn't be doing. Um, that got upset. Services got upset. Um, the number of people going twice went down a lot because most of the evening services um, had to stop because um, it's on the east and the south of the country. Um, and so his conclusion was the, the disruption caused by the war to the everyday life of organised religion probably accounts for the decreases that we've seen rather more than the loss of faith. People were, um, people's routine was interrupted massively. Uh, and there are some interesting questions there, I think, for what it's going to do to organise, what the pandemic today is going to do to organise religion in terms of people getting out of the habits of their church going and their social engagements around the life of the church. So finally, why was the impact of the Great War on the faith of the people of Britain um, so limited? Let me share a couple of quotations. One, influence, one reason is the way people look back on those experiences. Sidney Rogerson writes in 1933. I won't read it, you can read it yourselves for a moment. I suppose one parallel is the way in which many mining communities look back at the, um, the days of active mining, that they wouldn't want their sons to go through it, and yet the men look back on that time of comradeship, um, of the focus around the mines of the community, uh, as being in many ways such a positive thing that's now gone um, with the end of, of, of mining. Guy Chapman was an academic historian. I think he finished his career uh, at the University of Exeter. He was no fool. He was an extremely bright, intelligent man. He wasn't going to be conned. Um, now again, I won't read it. Bradley Jest, dressed young woman, was the woman he was to marry. Um, that was the best thing in his life. But then he says, to the years between 14 and 18, I owe everything of lasting value in my makeup for any cost I paid in physical and mental vigour. They gave me back a supreme fulfilment. I should never otherwise have had. And as I read that, I think of some of the reports coming back from NHS health workers at the moment, um, who particularly during April and early May were faced with dreadful challenges, the threat of um, their IC units being overwhelmed. And yet there's 
come out of that a sense of a job well done and a sense of pulling together and corporate action um, to defeat the enemy, if you like. Uh, although I'm not going along with Mr. Johnson's uh, analogies too far. There was a detachment um, from ordinary soldiers uh, and clergy alike. Some um, parish magazines, for example, are full of a narrative of the war. Um, each month, the vicar does his own little pop summary of what's been happening. In other parish magazines, uh, you wouldn't know the war exists. They're telling us about the flower competitions, uh, about the confirmation classes, uh, and the war is not mentioned. There was a sense of detachment. Um, soldiers didn't engage with the questions that you might think, you know, where is God in all this? Not many of them did. Theologians meant something quite different than today. Um, when I was in college 35 years ago, we were told we are to be reflective practitioners. Reflect theologically on that, we were told. Back in the time of the First World War, no. no theologians are the ones in Oxford and Cambridge. Um, the, the biographer of um, Randall Davidson, um, the um, Archbishop of Canterbury says, he was not himself a theologian. That's the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, who is described in those terms. Um, so people didn't want to reflect themselves, they just wanted to be told the answers. Um, and actually most of the common rooms in Oxford and Cambridge were pretty silent on the issues. Um, there was suddenly a loss of confidence and, and far fewer papers uh, were published. There was the argument that the ways of God pass all understanding. Studdock Kennedy has a excoriating poem called The Sermon, which lays into this a parody um, of the chaplain saying, my God, the ways of God you cannot understand. Uh, and he goes on and on and on for that. It's, uh, I, thought it was a, I thought it was a spoof, but a commentator at the time says, no, this is what was being said. And then there's the deferential culture of the army of Britain, um, eroding by the First World War, but still present, the hierarchical nature of the army. Uh, and the simplest way of putting that is if you don't challenge your captain, you're not going to challenge God and say, God, why is this happening? That, that is so countercultural um, that those questions were not asked. And finally, let's go back to that quotation from uh, Jeffrey Husbands with which I started. All that weak armistice, that mystic and blessed word had been in the air with incessant rumours that the war was almost over. And at Bethesda Chapel that night, the coming of peace seemed very near. We sang with deeper feeling and more than the usual heartiness that a favourite hymn evokes at any time. Now thank we all our gods. And the service ended, and we poured out into the darkness of the streets. It indeed seemed we were right at the end of an epoch. And that, I think, is one of the major reasons um, why the impact of the Great War on the faith of the people of Britain was so limited. God had given Britain and her empire the long prayed for victory. When the king... Um, issues a declaration at the end of the war. It is not to thank his generals, his field marshals, the forces. It's to thank God um, that the victory has come. Uh, and so all the language of right triumphing over might, uh, the fight for liberty and justice and civilization, all that had been proved right. It'd be a fascinating um, counterfactual exploration to say what would have happened to the faith of the people of Britain if the First World War had not been won, um, but then we're getting into the realms of fiction um, rather than the fact. And as Tim mentioned, if you want to read more, Faith in Conflict is published by Helen in 2016. It's about £30, so it's an absolute bargain, and I'll leave it there.